Let me explain a few things about the book of Genesis. Because I don't want to get so focused that you don't see the whole. All right? So let me explain a few things about the book of Genesis. The first 11 chapters covers about 2,000 years of history at a very rapid pace. It covers creation, the fall of mankind, the flood, and why we have different nations with different languages. And from the end of chapter 11 on, the pace slows very dramatically. It's almost like you put the brakes on because we have been clipping along at this fast pace. Boy, we had this event and this event and this event. And then all of a sudden, you just put the brakes on, and now we're going to slow down dramatically. In fact, the next 13 chapters only covers a 100-year period and focuses on just one man, and that man is Abraham. Now, why is that? Does anyone know? Why are we going to put the brakes on? Why are we going to focus in on Abraham and specifically his life over about a hundred year period? We're going to pick it up when he's about 75 years old and we're going to go all the way to his death at 175. Why are we going to slow down and concentrate on his life? Does anyone know? It's because the Messianic prophecy given in Genesis 3.15 is going to be fulfilled through the Jewish nation. And Abraham is the father of that nation. He's the father of the Jewish race. Now, this is very important. You need to understand this. Because if you don't understand this, it looks like God is playing favoritism. He loves the Jews. They are his chosen people. And then when we track their history, we go, ooh, maybe you don't want to be part of his chosen people. Look what's happened to them. But they are his chosen people. And the Old Testament's all about the Jews. It's like all the other nations really don't matter. God loves the Jews, and God says, if you bless them, God will bless you. If you curse them, God will curse you. And if you go through history, you'll find that to be true. Anyone who's ever come in and cursed the nation of Israel, done something against them, they've been cursed. You see it all through history. And so we begin to think that maybe God plays favoritisms. Why favoritism? Why does he love Abraham? Why does he love the Jewish nation? Well, God does not play favoritism. He loves everyone. But, and this is what I want you to see, it all goes back to this messianic prophecy in Genesis chapter 3, verse number 15. And if you don't understand Genesis 3, 15, you don't understand the Old Testament. And the New Testament is built upon the Old Testament. So let's go back to Genesis chapter 3, verse number 15, and let's read it. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Now, we've already covered this. We covered this when we were studying the fall of man. So I'm just going to skim over this very, very fast, or very, very quickly. This is a messianic prophecy. And in this prophecy, God promised to put enmity between the serpent and the woman, and between his seed and the woman's seed. And of course, when he's talking about the serpent, that is symbolic for who? Satan. All right? Now, the woman's seed refers to Jesus. We know that for two reasons. First of all, a woman doesn't have seed. The word seed is translated from the Hebrew word zerah, which means semen or sperm. And a woman doesn't have semen, only a man does. So this is clearly implied that someday a Savior will be conceived supernaturally and be born of a virgin. Secondly, the woman's seed is referred to as a person. Look back at verse number 15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Now, do you see that personal pronoun? He shall bruise your head. He is the Hebrew word who. Who is a personal pronoun. Third person, masculine, singular, if you want to conjugate it, which tells us that the woman's seed refers to a person, more specifically, a man. And that man is who? Jesus Christ. So Genesis 3.15 is a prophecy of the coming Messiah. Someday, a man is going to be supernaturally conceived and be born of a virgin. Because he's going to be born of a virgin, he won't partake of the inherited sin nature of Adam. And he's going to be able to redeem man from their sin. He's going to be able to offer himself as a sacrifice for sin. And when all of our sin is paid for, God is going to be able to legally raise him from the dead. Because... Leviticus 18.5 says, the man who keepeth the law, the man who 
keeps it perfectly, she'll live by it. So what God is going to do is he's going to look down into hell. He's going to see this man who did not have the atomic nature, who's been made sin for all of us, and in becoming our sin, actually fulfilled the law. Because all of the law can be summed up in two statements. To love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, no greater love hath a man than he lays down his life for his friend. So with Jesus willing to take upon himself our sin and to die for us, he actually fulfills the law. So when all of our sin is paid for, God looks down into hell, he sees a soul that's never sinned, and he's able to legally raise him from the dead. Now, in becoming our sin, of course, I'm not going to get into all of this. We're made one with him because we enter into what is called a marriage covenant with Jesus Christ. He that's joined to the Lord is one spirit. But I want you to understand, we're getting ahead of ourselves. At this point in the story, at Genesis chapter 3, verse number 15, all we really know is that a Redeemer is going to come to crush Satan's head and to break the power that he holds over mankind because of sin. So from Genesis chapter 3, verse number 15 on, Satan is going to do everything that he can to try and stop the seed of the woman from coming.